he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord, Jesus Christ. If you're able, please join us in standing and singing this morning.
So Jesus, that's what we celebrate this morning. For every single one of us who knows you, for every one of us, uh, God, who's been reconciled and redeemed by you, we all share a day. We share a day where we heard you call our name and where we ran out of that grave. And so we thank you this morning for redemption. We thank you for what we have in you. And uh, God, would you just remind us of that this morning? In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. 
Hey, if you're in the room, would you just take a second, turn and just shake somebody's hand or, or fist bump or whatever uh, is your style before you take a seat? Good. Awesome. And if you're watching online with this as well, whether you're watching by yourself or you're watching with a group of people, we're thrilled that you joined in with us as well. And uh, it's great to have you. I'd love to just tell you guys, if I could, um, a couple of things that are coming up here in the next month at Frontline. First of all, is what we were just singing about, this, this hope that we have in Christ. Uh, we are going to be celebrating our next baptism service is going to be March 20th. And so uh, that's going to be an incredible day. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be an awesome time together. So if you uh, have taken that step of, of making Jesus Lord of your life and you're ready to get baptized, we call it going public with our faith. Um, so whether, you were, uh, whether you've never been baptized before in your life or maybe you were baptized as an infant, um, but now you, you've started following Christ. And so as a believer, you'd like to take that step. We would love to connect with you. So if you want to go to frontlinegr.com forward slash baptism, that's the best way to let us know. And we'd love to just connect with you and make sure you're all set and ready because that's going to be an incredible day of celebration. Uh, also, our next newcomer's meal is coming up on March 6th. So if you've been coming if, or watching online, if you're newer to our church and maybe you've been wondering, how do I connect with other people and grow spiritually at Frontline? That's exactly what that meal is designed to do, is, is to help you uh, connect and, and to hear about how, some next steps you can take. And so uh, we will feed you. We just need you to sign up. That's all you need to do. So it's March 6th, next Sunday right after this service, the 11 o'clock service at noon. And if you're in the room, I'm pointing to where it's at. It's actually in our now gen area, uh, which is right over here to my right, your left, our student ministry area. And if, you're, uh, if you've never been in the building before, I encourage you to come that day. There will be signs. Don't worry, you'll be able to find it. Uh, but again, sign up, let us know, for, uh, forward slash newcomers, or you can go to the I'm new spot on our website and it drops down right there. Um, but with that being said, I, I would love to invite Faith Netsonet uh, to come and join me up here on the, the stage. So Faith and her, her husband, Orion, um, have for the last several years been leading our partnership in Ukro, Ethiopia. We actually have a care point community that we're partnered with across the world through Children's Hope Chest in Ukro, Ethiopia. And it started in, in uh, 2015, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so uh, there was a team of people from Frontline uh, my wife was actually on that team. They, they went and actually established that care point. And I wish I could put all of you on a plane and take you there to see the impact. I was there with my son, John, in 2018. You're going to see some of the pictures from that trip. And just the life and the impact uh, that has happened in that community and the staff that are, that are all there just doing an incredible job partnering with a church uh, there, uh, Gospel Center Church in Ukro, and helping um, just bring life. So many of you sponsor children. Uh, that $45 a month has made a huge impact and continues to make a huge impact, not only in education, but um, helping uh, meet some needs. And then uh, we also built a, a water kiosk that's been bringing water. We got to actually see that when we were there. It's brought water and life to the community. And then also we helped uh, to fund and start some what's called IGAs, Income Generating Activities, which are kind of like small business loans that have helped the families who are part of the care point there actually be able to, to start small businesses and become sustainable as a family. The impact is just incredible. Um, so today we're going to be taking another step uh, with our partnership in Ucro. So if you're in the room, you're sitting on it probably. If you haven't noticed, it's a card. It looks like this. If you want to grab that right now, and if you're watching online, it'll be popping up on the screen in front of you. There's a QR code there um, that you can actually just kind of open the camera of your phone and take a picture of, and it'll take you right to the website. But what we're doing is uh, we're, we're taking a next step with, with our sponsorship model. It's called, it's going to be called a friendship model. And so, um, Faith, can you just uh, explain a little bit what the friendship model is and why we're switching to it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I feel like most of us are familiar with traditional child sponsorship and the way that that works. Mm -hmm. So friendship model is changing the narrative with that. It's shifting the narrative to instead empower each child with voice and choice. So instead of us seeing pictures of kids and looking through them and saying, okay, I, I want to 
and select this child and sponsor this child. We're instead getting pictures of you um, or you're choosing a picture that's already in your phone. And we're able to share that with the care point and they print them out and they hang them up at the care point and they just go wild. They have their own celebration day. It's really exciting. Uh, the community rallies around them. The staff and the kids have a blast. And it's an opportunity for the children to be able to look through all of your pictures and say, okay, you, I choose you. I want them to be my Hope Chest friend. And so it's just another way of doing it and it's a way that we're able to further empower these kids with the dignity that they deserve. Yeah, which is awesome. And so right now we have about 100 kids in the care point that are currently sponsored by Frontliners. And we've got 26 kids who have come online who are part of the care point who are awaiting a sponsor. And that would just be an incredible thing if we could just take care of that today and just get all the 26 of those kids, at least faces of us to choose from as to become a, a, a care point friend. But one of the questions you may be asking, if you are one of that, uh, one of the people who already sponsor a child, um, what does this mean, this, this transition to a friendship model? What does that mean for you? Can you answer that? Yeah, absolutely. So if you do already sponsor, first, thank you for doing so. Um, we've seen it firsthand, those of you who have traveled to the care point and you've hung out with the kids and the families, um, you've seen it, just the very real, tangible ways you're making um, changes in their lives and impacting their lives for the better. Um, so thank you. And I would say and absolutely encourage those, whether or not you already sponsor, we would love to invite you to also sign up and register to become a Hope Chest friend through the friendship model. Yeah. Awesome. So in order to, to do that, uh, basically you can go, you can open your phone right now and go to that QR code and it's going to ask you to upload a picture. If you do not have a picture of yourself or your family on your phone, uh, or, you know, maybe you don't like your family. I don't know. You don't want them on the picture. <laughs> that could be, but if you would like uh, to take a picture, we actually set up a photo uh, opportunity. There's, there's kind of like a photo booth area right outside. If you're, you're physically in the room, it's right out here on the other side of these doors where uh, you can actually take a picture and we'll actually help you make sure you get that picture uploaded so those 26 kids have faces and, and uh, people to choose from if you've got a picture uh, of yourself on your phone you can just use that QR code and we'll stick around too at the end of this service if anybody's having trouble operating their phone or just operating the QR code for whatever reason uh, we'll, we'll hang out here down by the stage and, and help anybody who, who needs help doing that but uh, can we say thank you to Faith and Orion both uh, for the way they've led our thank care you. point yeah seriously thank you made a huge impact well, that being said, I'd love to transition us into a time of giving. And so if you're giving an offering this morning, there are four ways you can give, either, both here in the room and online. And again, I just want to say thank you uh, for the way you guys give and, and out of your obedience to God, out of your faithfulness to him, it makes everything we do possible. And uh, even just the impact we're having in a, in a community like Ucro is, is because of your faithfulness in that area. So let's pray. And then David's going to come and share with us this morning, this third uh, generation of our, our sermon series. So Lord, we just uh, come before you right now and we just thank you that you are a God who redeems that you call us, God, to be a part of your church and the gospel going forward in the world. And so, uh, God, as we give this morning, we do so with a cheerful heart. We do so out of an attitude uh, of just thankfulness of what you have done on our behalf. And so would you take these gifts and use them? And God, we think about places in our world right now uh, that are so dark and, and so in need. I just lift up right now, God, Ukraine and uh, all that's happening. Just pray for just a quick resolve to, to the tension and, and the, the fighting and the war that's happening. And uh, God, just for your ways to prevail. Pray for family and friends who are there. Uh, God, and just, just ask that your, your peace would continue to extend through your church, God, to all places in the world. And we thank you that we get to do that together. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen.
Well, good morning, Frontline. It's good to see all of you. It's good to have you in the room. If you're joining online, it's good to have you as well. In fact, if you're watching or listening online, uh, we're going to have communion together today later in the service. So just want to give you an opportunity between now and a couple minutes from now just to go ahead and grab a cracker or grape juice or anything that's similar uh, just so that you can be a part and join us in community as well. Uh, I want to talk to the parents in the room uh, or online just at the beginning. So how many of you, isn't it true that you have a different level of appreciation for your parents after you become one? Anybody else, you know what I'm talking about? My parents, uh, when I was younger, they used to say this thing to me over and over, and I, I thought it was like, I thought it was going to work out for me in the end. They used to say, I pray that someday you have a child just like you. <laughs> That's what they used to say to me. And you know what? In my ignorance, I retorted back and I said, you know what? Me too, because I'll understand them. Well, here we are years later, and I understand their prayer in a totally different way because I got one. And uh, it's a little bit different than what I would have anticipated. But isn't it true, right? Uh, before we brought Jordan home, so we just had a, a new baby. I want to show you my family here. Uh, so obviously this is my wife, Shannon. Judah is our three-year-old. And then Jordan, we just had him in December, a couple days before Christmas. So isn't it true when you bring home a child for the very first time, it changes everything? That's what happened when we had Judah. We brought home Judah and I was like, wow, I'm no longer the center of my wife's universe. Now he is. That was a different change for me as he's gotten older, as he can talk and communicate. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing, right? We're, we're working on like some behavioral modification things for Judah, but I, I'm totally comfortable standing up here telling you I get manipulated by my son all the time. All the time. He's a, he's a three-year-old mastermind. He just knows how to get what he wants. So a couple different things that we're working on since we brought home Jordan uh, is his world changed, right? Judah is now no longer the center of the universe. His brother is, right? So I'm like, Judah, welcome to the club, man. I've been here for a while. Nice to have some company. So Jordan now is in our house and we're, we're working on some things that we want to do or to see improve in Judah's behavior. So here's a couple examples. One, potty training. We don't like doing diapers for two kids. We like doing diapers maybe for one, maybe for one, right? If Jordan could get there, we would get there. So Judah, we're working on potty training. He's doing amazing. But right now, as of this week, we're working on coordination, right? So not peeing on the wall, just peeing in the toilet is where we're starting this week. Uh, sharing toys. Judah hasn't had to share toys. He's never had to. So we practice with other people's kids. We had our small group over this last week and I'm watching Judah on repeat struggling over and over and over of letting go of his toys so that somebody else can play with them. Here's another one, staying in bed. I literally wrote this. This is the description I put in this one. Just shoot me. I am so sick of fighting with my kid on bedtime. He was out of bed, Shannon told me when I got home last night, like eight or nine times. And he does this, thing, especially the first time he comes out and he goes, something's wrong. I go, oh, well, what can I do? How can I help? What's, is your stomach hurt? Right? You got a fever? Right? Something's wrong. I, what's wrong, Judah? Tell me. Um, um, because I was like, you're using me right now. You need to get back in bed. This is an everyday thing. But then here's the last one. It's how to treat a baby. This is what we're working on with Judah. So on Monday this last week, Shannon's upstairs, she's getting ready. And all of a sudden she hears Jordan shriek, like screaming his head off. She runs down the stairs, flies down. And she's like, what happened? What's wrong? What's wrong? And Judah's standing right next to the baby going, I'm sorry. <laughs> right. So as a parent, you're like, what did you do? Right. It's like, okay, he's not a terrorist. We don't have to waterboard. Just, Hey, what did you do? Judah? Just talk to me. What, what did you do? What did you do? And he goes, I'm really sorry. <laughs> Judah, please. And he goes, I bit his finger. <laughs> so we start. Why? Why would you do that? And he goes, he said this, and I talked to him later. I said, daddy's going to talk about you on Sunday. So I need to understand the full story here of what happened. And he goes, well, I bit his nail. So here's what we think happened. We think Jordan, right, baby nails, accidentally scratched Judah on his face, and Judah bites his nails. So he goes, I'll just solve it for him. I'll grab his hand and I'll bite his nail off. And that didn't go the way he planned. So this is what we're working on, right? His intentions are usually good, but his behaviors could use some work. Isn't that true for all of us? Most of us come into life, we come into church, we come into marriage, we come into work, whatever it is, most of us come in and we have pretty good intentions. If you could see the intention of most of our hearts, most of us would say, my intentions are good. 
I want to behave well. I want to do well. I want to be better. I want to be good, whatever. Most of us come in with good intentions, but our behavior is the area of life that can use some work. That's why if you go to Planet Fitness right now, it's packed. It's packed of people trying to change their behaviors. They're trying to get better at something. They're trying to start doing something. They're trying to be healthy. That's why there's a healthy food section at Meijer when you go grocery shopping. I have no idea where it is, but the people that are looking for it end up finding the healthy food section because they're trying to make themselves better. Habits, right? It's trying to stop bad habits, things that we naturally do. We have a natural inclination. We try to stop doing that thing and start doing the right thing. What about the office? Have you ever heard of like a performance improvement plan? We're trying to change behaviors. Maybe it's our behaviors. Maybe it's the behaviors of other people. Or this one, the judicial system. Jail, prison, rehab, pr uh, probation. It doesn't matter what it is. What, the system is trying to change your behaviors. So often, we come into the church with the exact same mentality, is we come in and we go, okay, I, I need to change my behavior. I need to be better. I need to be good. I need to behave. I need to start doing the right things, stop doing the wrong things. Do you ever feel like God just wants you to change your behavior? In your relationship with him, do you ever feel like he just wants you to change? I know I do. Man, for most of my life, I, I felt like I had to earn the affection of God because I was the kid that couldn't behave. Didn't matter what setting I was in, didn't matter if it was with my siblings, if it was in public or private, how I talked, the tone I used, whatever I did, I was this kid that always got in trouble, I always misbehaved, and my intentions were good, but man, my behavior needed a lot of work. And at some point, isn't it true for all of us, when our behavior doesn't measure up to what we want it to be or what it's expected to be, sometimes we just quit. Sometimes we just give up and we say, I guess that's just who I am then. I'm the kid that doesn't behave. I'm the kid that doesn't get along. I'm the kid that can't do it, won't do it, refuses to do it. I'm the kid that's always going to be in trouble. At some point, we'd stop fighting and we just say, guess I can't change. I guess I'll earn my reputation. That one's gotten me in trouble growing up, especially, man, if I'm going to get in trouble, I'm going to earn getting in trouble. And I did. So many times we come into the church and we think when we give our lives to Jesus, the expectation then is that our behaviors change like that. That, that, that we have to earn our salvation, that we have to contribute to it, that God did his part, but now I have to do mine. And you know what? That's bad theology. Yet all of us do it. We all succumb to it. In fact, Paul, the Apostle Paul, is writing to a church that did just the same thing. This is a small church in Colossae. It was very small, but the danger that they ran into is they started pulling different theology, different, different pieces of different groups or different religions, and they tried to merge it into one. And so it included things like uh, Christianity, legalistic Judaism, mysticism, and then Gnosticism, which is basically all about you just be better. You just work. The more knowledge you get, the better you'll be. So as you grow, you can actually earn your salvation. This is a tiny little brand new church that Paul is writing to them from a prison cell. He's writing to them saying, man, we're praying for you, but you need to understand what you are adopting as your theology is not right. Here's what he says, Colossians 1 verse 9. He says, for this reason, since the day that we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Most of us are tracking with him. Most of us understand. It's like he's saying, hey, we're praying for you. Your theology is all over the place. What you believe to be true, what you're trying to learn, you think it's going to achieve your salvation. You think that you can actually change your behavior on your own. So we've been praying for you since the day we heard this. We've been praying for you that you would understand who Jesus really is. But he's talking about behavior, right? So we go, yeah, I understand. I understand the behavior piece. But then let's keep reading. Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. Pause there. Isn't it true? That often when we're working at something in our own power or in our own might or in our own strength, our endurance is diminished significantly. Our ability to hold that pace or to hold that habit, 
or to break the old, it is so much smaller. And what Paul is saying is that applies to faith. If you're going to try to earn your salvation, if you're going to try to work for it, if you're going to try to change you and think that that is part of the equation that achieves salvation for you, your endurance is nothing. You're going to burn out. You're going to quit. You're going to give up. You're just going to adopt it. I'm never going to change. He says, in giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Notice, he's starting to pivot here, and he's not talking about the actions and the behaviors of the people. He's going to begin to talk about the actions and behavior of God. He's switching. He's changing. He's changing his tone. So think about this, behavior modification. That's what so many people in Colossae are thinking about. And Paul is writing, but it begins to shift. Colossians 1, verse 13. Here's the big statement. He says, for he has rescued us. If you have your Bible in the room, underline these first five words in verse 13. For he has rescued us. For he has rescued us. It is not the behavior of them that earned their salvation. It is the behavior of Jesus. It is what he did, what he accomplished on the cross. God rescued us. That's what Paul needs this Colossian, Colossian church to hear. That's what Paul needs us to hear today. That it's not your behavior. You don't contribute to your own salvation. You receive it. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We can't rescue ourselves. Behavior change happens as a result. And it happens over time. And it happens in a community of believers. It happens as you continue repeatedly, daily, submitting to the word of God, following the prompting of the Holy Spirit, allowing him to lead and shape and mold your heart to become more and more like his. It's as Jesus does his work in us that our behaviors will eventually follow. It's a byproduct, but this is different than what the, the people in Colossae believed. What they believed is this, Jesus plus good behavior plus willpower plus knowledge plus a couple other things equals salvation. And they're wrong. They were wrong. Paul tells them they were wrong. I mean, it, Paul is writing this from a jail in Rome. And you can almost picture him saying like, you can save yourself just as much as I can release myself from prison. You're powerless. I'm powerless. We are powerless to change or to save ourselves. Here's what Paul is trying to say, if we summarize it this way. The cross is a rescue operation, not a behavioral modification program. The cross is a rescue operation. In fact, let, let's take it one step further. The cross is a rescue operation from a behavioral modification program. If you think about it, so often what we come in is we go, okay, I need to earn the affection of God. I need to earn the worthiness of what Jesus did. I need, I need to contribute or I need to sacrifice or I need to do something that contributes to it. But, but it's not that theology doesn't lead us to life. What Jesus did on the cross for us is all is required. We, we can't contribute anything beyond that. You can save yourself just as much as Paul can release himself from prison. It's just impossible. But then he continues here. It says, Colossians 2, verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. When you were dead. Notice he doesn't say when you're gasping for air. He doesn't say as you're trying harder. He doesn't say as you improve and as you take the first couple steps, what he says is when you were dead in your sins, like KO, DOA, like you, you contribute nothing to the equation, game is over, time is out. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the, say it with me, yes. cross. 
the theology, the understanding, or the belief that I can contribute to my own salvation, Jesus nailed that to the cross. You can't fix you. You can't change you. Jesus can. Jesus died for the sins of the world, for what separates us, including a behavioral modification program. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. As the cross stood on that mountain, it looked like a victory for the evil one. But Jesus' resurrection three days later made that cross a symbol forever that there is nothing God can't do. That God takes dead things and he brings them back to life. So let's talk about our behavior again. When did Jesus die for you? When, when have you gone too far or whatever? I, I made this slide, I think it's funny. When you're fixing it, numbing it, avoiding it, ignoring it, blaming it, denying it, clicking it, swiping it, eating it, drinking it, smoking it, watching it, bopping it. When you're doing all of these things, Jesus died for you. Not when you're done doing it, in the middle of it. Your behavior is what separates. Our behavior is what separates us from God. And God says, when you're in the middle of it, when you are dead, 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 there's no coming back. When you are dead, that's when I died for you. So I could actually make you alive. It's not so you could change yourself. It's not so you could fix yourself. It's not so you could earn it. When you were dead, I can bring you back to life. We don't need a three-step plan. We don't need more knowledge. We don't need more strength, more time, or, my mo or more money. What we need is to be rescued. One of the things I did when I was in high school, uh, I thought I was going to be a police officer, and uh, I was wrong. Ha <laughs> ha, go figure. I thought I was going to be a police officer, and so I tried to, I did this thing called law enforcement explorers. I had a lot of fun, like, learned how to clear a building, learned how to do a felony stop, learned how to use a gun. Like, it, it was a lot of fun, honestly. Went to the Michigan State Police for a week through the American Legion. Uh, in fact, mentors told me, hey, as you go into this, like, training, they're going to treat you like you're in the academy, and you will know at the end of it if you're going to be a cop or not. I went, sweet, sounds amazing. I went there, dude, I knew I wasn't going to be a cop during PT. That was enough for me. Right, 5.15 in the morning, I still remember it. I ran up to the, to the officer in charge, and he's like, all right, you got to do 20 pull-ups here, and you got to run a lap here and do this. And I ran over, and I hung on that pull-up bar, and I went, can't do it, sir. And he's like, uh, I don't ever I run a lap. I was like, I'm not going to be a cop. I'm definitely not going to be a cop. I can tell already. That first fence, that'll knock me out. So I'm at this thing, but one of the things we got to do was we actually learned how to do water rescue. So in an EMT class that I took when I was in high school, um, I actually became like a licensed EMT and we had a whole chapter dedicated to water rescues of like what we're supposed to do and we had to learn a lot and this is how you respond and this is what your body does and et cetera. So here's what I want you to understand about how basic my training is. Um, for the level of EMT I am, it's like entry, entry, entry level. There are six medications that we are allowed to admit, administer and oxygen and glucose are two of them. So one third of my medication ability, like you, you just had a heart attack, right? You had a broken bone, it's sticking out or a car accident. I, I'm there going, you know, oxygen, sugar, anything I can contribute to this equation here? Bee sting, uh, one of these, it sounds like they would help. You know, you still need oxygen. You can administer the same medications that I could. Okay, so understand how basic this was. So here's the problem. Um, what we learned is this is what to do in case of an emergency, particularly in a water emergency. So when you fall in like a, a cold environment or when cold water hits your face, your body actually starts shutting down. Do you know that? This was so cool. We actually hooked up like a, a heart rate monitor and pulse ox, whatever. We hooked all of it up to somebody in the room and we took a bowl of cold water and they put their face in it and we watched all of their vitals plummet. So here's what your body does. Your body jumps into survival mode and tries to maintain its most core temperature so that you can survive uh, for an extended period of time. So here's what we learned as EMTs, right? When we rolled up, we had to do a couple things. Number one, get somebody out of the water. 
That's step number one. Get them out of the water if you can. Clear anything out of their mouth or airway. Check for their pulse and breathing. If they don't have one, start doing CPR and then do it until you hand them over to a doctor, right? Somebody who knows what they are doing. Our job as EMTs, and they drilled this into us, is you do not get to declare people dead. That is not your job. That is not your role. Your job is to administer CPR as long as possible until you can hand them over. So that means hours, like you could be doing CPR for hours until you hand somebody over. So role play this with me. So I wanna show you this image. So this is Lake Michigan. This is in downtown Chicago. Um, I'm from Chicago, so I liked this photo. But imagine, right, so the water's cold, it's icy. Imagine you're out, you're walking on the pier, let's say Navy Pier, and somebody falls into the water. What happens physiologically in their body is their, their extremities are beginning to lose blood. So that means you, you can swim, right? You can move your arms and whatever, but, but the longer you're in there, the less actually you are able to move. Your body starts, starts removing all of the blood to, to maintain your core body temperature. Let's say they start getting farther and farther away from the pier. You, you start running through like, oh man, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to, oh, let's go back. I'm supposed to get them out of the water, clear their mouth or airway, check for pulse and breathing. If they don't have one, start doing CPR. I can't do any of that stuff though because I can't get in the water with them. I'm going to be in the same spot they are in an instant. So what, what do I do? So now imagine this, okay? So imagine this is my EMT textbook. You see somebody in the water. It's like, whoa, they're struggling. They're not doing good. They're really fighting to stay. Their body's starting to shut down. They're starting to drink water and starting to breathe. It's the equivalent of us going, I got a, I got a book. Read this, right? He just thought, page 47. This water, is that going to help anybody that's drowning? Is it going to help anybody? Here's a wild fact for you. Do you know most drownings actually occur surrounded by people? Not in isolation. So imagine, all, let's say there's a lot of people around and someone is struggling, somebody's drowning, and a lot of people don't even see it. We toss a book or we toss a manual or we toss something. And we say, here, fix yourself. Save yourself. I mean, imagine, hey, can you swim back to the pier? I'm over here. Can, can you swim? Nope, starting to lose function of my extremities, which means I'm going to lose the ability to stay afloat. Start drinking water, start breathing water. They are in trouble. They do not need a behavior modification program. What do they need? They need a rescuer. They need one who's been trained. They need one who can jump in the water, who has the equipment, who has the tools. Let's just summarize this. Who has the ability to save them. They need a rescuer. I already told you most drownings occur in large groups of people. I need to ask you this question. Is there somebody that's drowning spiritually in your life? Is there somebody that's trying to adopt this behavioral modification program? They're trying to, to wade through a marriage that's falling apart. They're trying to, to work through an addiction that they can't overcome. They're trying to work through something that is broken or devastating or difficult. I mean, when you think about your body, what your body does in cold water is very similar to what most of us do when we are in crisis too. We start to lose the ability to function like everybody else. We start losing the ability because we're treading water, because we're getting tired, because we're losing the ability to actually endure or go for a long period of time because we're by ourselves and we need a rescuer. What is our job as the church? A drowning person does not need a behavioral modification program. They need a rescuer, which means our job as the church, I can't save people. You, you can't save people, but Jesus can. Our job, our role as followers of Jesus is to introduce people to our rescuer. That's our job. That's our role. I want to share a crazy statistic with you. Um, as I was looking this up or doing homework, I wanted to find out, like, what's, what's the longest that somebody has ever survived, like a water drowning What's, what's the longest that they've survived with no heartbeat, no, no pulse on their own, no breathing? What, what's the longest? It'll surprise you. The longest somebody has survived with no ongoing complications is six hours and 52 minutes. 
That means their heart stopped. And six hours and 52 minutes later, after repeated CPR over and over and over of resuscitation efforts over and over and over, that person was able to come back to experience life to the full with no other complication. Our job as the church is same as an EMT. It is to introduce people to their rescuer and it is not to declare people dead. What God says is, even when they're dead, I can bring them back to life. Even when they're broken, even when they're addicted, even when they're far off, even when they're needy, whatever it is, I can save them. I can save them in the midst of it. Our role as followers of Jesus is to introduce people to their rescuer wherever they might be. So that includes in the classroom or the break room. That includes in the bar or at church. It's in the locker room or the laundromat. It's on the seat next to them on the bus or the seat next to them on the airplane. That's people in your neighborhood or people across the ocean in Ukro, Ethiopia. Our job as the church is to introduce people to our rescuer. So who's drowning? Who in your context, who in your life is struggling? who does not have a relationship with Jesus, maybe it's your time to step up, to take a risk, to start a conversation, to open it up and say, can I just introduce you to my rescuer? Because one introduction could change everything forever. So as we close, I just wanna, I wanna land here. What is God's response? What is his solution to a world that's riddled with brokenness, division, war, behavioral modification, drowning? What is God's solution? God's solution is the person of Jesus. He sent his one and only son who could atone for the sins of you and for me, who could take it all up on the cross, even in our deadest of dead moments, hanging on the cross saying, I can, I can resurrect that. I can bring that back to life. So what we're gonna do today, and I told you online earlier, is we're actually gonna close with communion together. Jesus, as he was upstairs in this upper room on the night that he would be betrayed, he actually looked at his disciples and he took bread and he took wine and he said this, hey, when you take this bread and he broke it right in front of him, when you take this and when you eat it, I want you to remember me and remember my body, which was broken for you on the cross. So every time you eat it, until I return, I want you to remember what I did for you. It says, then he, then he took the cup, the, the cup and he poured it out and he, he said, when you see, when you drink this, this is the blood of my covenant. When you drink this, I want you to remember me. When we eat the bread, when we drink the wine or the grape juice, it brings us back to a place of remembering I contribute nothing to my own salvation. In fact, what, what I do bring is everything that works against it. I bring my sin, I bring my shame, I bring my guilt, I bring my wrongdoing, I bring my brokenness, I bring my addiction, I bring whatever it is, I bring all of it up to the cross. The blood was supposed to represent the Old Testament sacrifice that God demanded of his people, that when you sin, when you wrong, the blood of an innocent animal would cover up your sin for you. Jesus says, when you drink of this, I want you to remember me that it was my blood that made you pure. It was my blood that made you whole. It was my blood, I am the sin offering that makes you right before God. So today as a church, in person, online, we're gonna take communion together. If you're in the room, we have a couple stations. There's two, one on each side, and then there's two in the back. Uh, at any point during this next song, I just encourage you, sit first and just go, okay, Lord, this is what I bring to this equation. Here's the pain, here's the mess, here's the brokenness, here's the sin, and just confess that to him. 
And then when you're ready, at some point in the next couple songs, go ahead and get up, move to one of the stations, grab the bread or the cracker and the grape juice, bring it back to your seat, and you take that when you're ready. And when you do so, remember, remember what Jesus did for you and for me on the cross.
So Jesus, this morning, we just thank you that you are a rescuer, that in you there is rescue because you came as a savior. So God, this morning, we don't find our solutions in what the world has to offer or some uh, burden of trying to fix ourselves. It doesn't come from our own effort. It doesn't come from our own merit. Our solutions this morning are found in the broken body and in the shed blood of Jesus. And so, God, uh, even as we walk out of this place today, would you help us to be those who introduce others to the rescue, uh, wherever that may be in our world, God, whether it be here in Grand Rapids, whether it be through Ukro, Ethiopia, wherever it is, Lord, uh, we want to be carriers of that message. So allow us to be that in Jesus' name, we all said, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being with us online and in person. One last thing before you go, as you walk out, I'd love for you to just to check out the table there, um, as well as if uh, the photo booth, if you want to have a picture taken, we can help you. And then uh, Faith and I will uh, stake around up here. Um, we're going to put that, um, that uh, uh, card back on the screen. Please take these cards with you. If you need any help uh, using that QR code and getting your photo uploaded, we'll hang around. We'd love to help you guys. Other than that, love you. Have a great day. We'll see you next time.